let me first introduce the uh, first presenter, Professor Yang Xiaohon. Uh, Professor Xiaohon is a WM Tech Professor of Energy at MIT with a joint appointment in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Department of Material Science and Engineering. She, uh, her research programs are centered on exploiting chemical materials physics and physical materials chemistry principles to understand charge transfer at the solid gas and solid liquid interfaces with applications for clean air and clean energy technology. She is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and is also among the world's most influential scientific minds, as well as a highly cited researcher based on more than 300 journal publications. She has also received a lot of excellent awards, but due to the time limitation, I'd like to stop introducing at this point. Okay, so everyone, please welcome the first presenter, Professor Yang Xiaohu. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, good morning, good evening. I'm delighted to be here and thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Really happy to be part of this uh, exciting material symposium. Low cost electrons from solar and wind offers great opportunities uh, and also challenges to decarbonize our transportation, our buildings and our industry. Although low cost electrons from wind and solar can be uh, as low as uh, two cents per kilowatt hour, but stored electrons can be many orders magnitude more expensive. If we think about the, in the past two centuries, scientists, engineers have uh, studied and discovered many different types of materials and chemistry to enhance its energy density and the lower its stored electron cost. First, we start with uh, redox metal uh, in uh, aqueous electrolytes, and then we replace the aqueous electrolyte with non-aqueous electrolyte and open up the operation window from let's say one or two volt to let's say four to five volt and from which lithium ion batteries were born. And today lithium ion battery technology not only dominate portable electronic devices but also is a technology of choice for electric vehicles and also has begun to penetrate for stationary applications at least for a short time storage. What do we have going beyond lithium ion? What if we want to uh, significantly lower its cost or significantly increase uh, its stored energy density? Hydrogen or hydrogen-based carriers and metals uh, can be potentially an option uh, from which many different new technologies can be developed and imagined. And with hydrogen or hydrogen-based carriers or, or metals, uh, we can uh, estimate uh, the upper limit of stored energy significantly higher than that of lithium ion batteries. Recently, together with my colleague, Doug Hart, we have demonstrated uh, aqueous electrolyte aluminum air batteries uh, with a significantly larger energy density on a weight basis relative to lithium ion batteries. So if we can uh, draw a common uh, theme for these uh, technologies or, or conversions beyond lithium ion, uh, we can think of we store electrons by chemical transform molecules or compound. For example, uh, water storing electrons through water splitting to generate hydrogen or CO2 reduction to generate uh, hydrocarbon as energy carriers or ammonia uh, high nitrogen reduction to make ammonia or reducing metal oxide to generate metals. During this step, we have oxygen evolution, right? Regardless of what type of energy carrier we make. Once we have the energy carrier, we can combine them with oxygen in electrochemical devices where we can utilize them chemically, right? It's through which we can actually generate work or release the energy stored and reform the chemicals or compounds uh, that stable under ambient conditions. 
as you can see, we have various transformation of small molecules. And unfortunately, the kinetics of many of these processes have very slow kinetics. And that translates to low efficiency uh, in the energy conversion devices, right? So panelize us essentially, instead of converting it to electricity, instead it generate heat. So this is where uh, either for oxygen reduction or oxygen evolution, CO2 reduction, nitrogen activation, or, make, um, or to make ammonia or to make, for example, nitrate requires uh, a catalyst. And so design of a catalyst is central to enable new technologies that can decarbonize and transform our energy landscape. So in this presentation, we're going to focus on one class of materials that are very important uh, for energy or clean energy, energy storage, and that's the oxides. We're going to look at several examples, how we can actually play with oxide electronic structure to tone essentially the functionality of oxides. So we're going to begin with uh, examples of looking at how to design oxides to catalyze, let's say, oxygen evolution reactions or surface uh, exchange kinetics and oxide-oxide interface. And then we're going to relate the same uh, reaction uh, scheme or the same concept of electronic structure toning uh, to uh, really selective uh, oxidation of fuel or um, oxidative dehydrogenation uh, at positive electrode uh, and electrolyte interface in lithium ion batteries. Because many of these positive electrode materials uh, have very similar uh, electronic structure uh, to some of the catalysts we use for uh, catalyzing oxygen related reactions. And then we're going to turn our attention to think about how to design our oxides so we can control essentially the oxide oxidation in terms of oxygen evolution or a controlling to enable lattice oxygen redox or coupling in the solid state. And what are the descriptors and how to design uh, uh, oxide to enable more lattice uh, oxygen redox, which is one mechanism to further enhance the stored energy density of lithium ion batteries. So we're going to begin uh, with a really valence band of oxides. So typically the physical chemical properties of oxides are, are largely controlled by the valence band, uh, which uh, consists of uh, metal D states and hybridized with oxygen uh, P states. And a few years ago, about a decade ago, in collaboration with Dane Morgan at University of Wisconsin, we have proposed that uh, uh, oxygen P-band center relative to the Fermi level, right? So essentially, as you change a different type of a D um, transition metal, and you can move your D states up and down relative to the oxygen P uh, states, uh, and you can also change the oxidation state of the transition metal through which you can change the filling of your D states that also changes the Fermi level, right? So what we proposed is that uh, if we uh, lower the Fermi level into the oxygen P band, it can significantly, for example, change the physical chemical property of the oxide. As so one example is uh, it can uh, significantly lower the oxygen formation energy penalty within these oxides. Then we uh, relate uh, this oxygen p-band, this parameter, uh, to several uh, reaction kinetics happening on the uh, surfaces of oxides. Right? So one example we have correlated is the surface exchange kinetics, which uh, has to do with uh, transformation of O2 to O2 minus, right, back and forth. Right? And that's described as oxygen surface exchange kinetics. I plotted as a function of oxygen p-band center relative to Fermi level. As you can see, by varying different type of perovskites, right? So if note that abbreviation uh, is uh, annotated on the left, where essentially we, we change the A site or the B side of perovskites, uh, and we would substitute different type of transition metal uh, onto, the, uh, onto the B site. Um, so, so for example, cobalt, 
uh, manganese and iron uh, are being used here. Right. So regardless what we have on the A side, what we have on the B side, uh, as long as we uh, lower the oxygen P-band center, lo lower the Fermi level into the oxygen P-band center, then we're going to the right-hand side, we can significantly increase its kinetics. Right? So over six mag order of magnitude uh, can be changed. Similarly, if we look at uh, analogous reaction where in basic solution, we can, um, let's say, oxidize water to evolve uh, oxygen. And for these um, reactions for perovskites, oxide, cobalt-based oxides, where the A size may be varied, uh, where we can also see significantly uh, increased activity. Right. Considering TAFO slope of 60 millivolt per decade, and this voltage change translates to uh, roughly two order magnitude. Right. So know that you know, what, where um, controlling is a bulk electronic uh, structure descriptor, which has been correlated to influence uh, the catalytic uh, reaction rate on the surface uh, related to oxygen evolution. Right. And know that oxygen P-band center was computed to a DFT, right? So we want to say, can we verify, right? Can we verify the trend in oxygen P-band center and this correlation, right? And correlation is not causation. What is really the mechanism behind this correlation? So we went and measured a number of uh, a dozen uh, or more of these oxides measured essentially the valence bond uh, at ALS in Berkeley. Right? So basically uh, what you can do is uh, you can measure uh, the valence band or oxygen KH through X-ray um, absorption spectroscopy, which measures unoccupied states. Uh, and also you can measure the occupied states with X-ray emission spectroscopy. And combination of X-ray absorption and X-ray emission with XPS, you can align them, uh, the spectra on the same uh, energy scale and also align them uh, to vacuum. Once so you have the energy levels on the vacuum scale, you can actually combine uh, them and align it with redox of hydrogen and redox of oxygen in the electrolyte. Right? So then through which you can actually develop interesting energetic parameters uh, through which you can uh, discuss uh, relevant energetics might enhance or uh, reduce the kinetics of oxygen evolution through water splitting. Right, so there's a few features to note. One is for the occupied states, we're interested uh, in this, the center of occupied uh, states. Right? And we're also interested in this peak in this unoccupied states that's related to ligand hole, where holes in the oxygen P-band due to hybridization with the metal. Right? And we're also interested in the Fermi level of the metal oxide relative to the Fermi level of the solution. Right. And by combining uh, these features, then we can actually develop energetic criterions or trends for oxygen evolution uh, activity. So we essentially summarize three important features, Fermi level of oxides and relative to Fermi level solution. And this energy difference will determine the driving force for the hydroxylation of the oxide surfaces when we immerse oxide into a solution. Also, we're interested in, let's say, this ligand energy level relative to the occupied uh, oxygen non-bonding center. And this essentially is a charge transfer energy that determines the energy penalty when we move electron from metal to uh, oxygen. And that also correlates with oxygen vacancy formation uh, pen energy penalty, also correlate with oxygen binding onto the surface. And lastly, we're also interested in the Fermi level of the solution relative to essentially this unoccupied uh, ligand hole states. And this is essentially measures what is the barriers if I want to oxidize water and what's the barrier for electron transfer uh, out of the electrolyte uh, onto an unoccupied states, right? So that's the uh, barrier for electron transfer. Right. And you can see from these an oxides, let's say uh, uh, 
10 uh, oxide or so, essentially as we go from early transition metal oxides to late transition metal, Fermi level goes down, right? meaning we're going to have more negatively charged surfaces when we immerse into a KOH, and also the barrier for electron transfer is uh, reduced, right? become essentially late transition metal oxides, they're metallic. Right? So we can combine them and put it together, essentially as we change the charge transfer energy, reduce the charge transfer energy by moving essentially metal D states uh, into the oxygen uh, P band. And we see the increase in activity, right? In oxygen evolution, regardless whether you're doing it at oxide oxide interface or you're doing an oxide solution interface. And the fundamental reason is that as we reduce the charge transfer energy, we reduce the barrier for electron transfer first. Right? And then once the oxide become metal, the oxygen evolution reaction is actually limited by the dehydrogenation, um, sorry, deprotonation reaction uh, associated with OH minus ions, because we're carrying out a reaction in the basic solution, is really approaching of OH minus ions to a negatively charged surface uh, to deprotonate, um, to, to generate oxygen. Right? So if we know now, and we have this hypothesis is really depronation due to the negative charge surface, right? Essentially repelling the OH minus hydroxide ions. So we want to test this idea by designing an oxide, for example, in this case is bismuth strontium cobaltite, where uh, we uh, contrast it with the strontium cobaltite, right? So in this case, we, we have them so that they have a similar covalency, right? So if you look at the cobalt 3D, oxygen 2P, they have the same energy level. So they have the same uh, charge transfer energy, same metal oxygen covalency. But we were able to use bismuth to essentially raise the Fermi level of this oxide relative to strontium cobaltite. As we discussed previously, if we raise the um, Fermi level oxide, it decreases the difference between the oxide Fermi level and the electrolyte Fermi level, and then that would generate a less negative charge surface. And uh, that would enhance essentially deprotonation through uh, approaching of OH minus. And indeed, with this oxides, that we have a significantly higher activity relative to a strontium cobaltite. And this is uh, essentially true uh, for a different solution of KOH, uh, roughly in an order of magnitude enhanced. Um, Catalytic activity. This is normalized to the specific area we're looking at the intrinsic rate, right? So if we translate this rate uh, to a turnover frequency, and you can see for these type of uh, barium strontium uh, cobalt oxides, uh, to our knowledge, uh, they have the highest turnover frequency uh, per metal sites relative to other known uh, oxides, including ruthenium or uranium dioxide. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these oxides uh, still on a per metal site basis, uh, about two order magnitude lower than the, the metal centers we use uh, in a photosystem too. Right? So this is really the challenge uh, going forward. How do we uh, create the structural flexibility of uh, what we have in photosystem two will maintain the stability feature of uh, of the metal oxides. How can we essentially design also the electrolytes, tone the electrolytes um, that beyond what uh, we have uh, currently? So these represent some of uh, exciting opportunities to bridge and go beyond to what we have intrinsically on the activity per metal site. Uh, for practical applications, not only we want to have high activity, high turnover per uh, surface, uh, per metal site, per surface area, we also want to essentially have a high surface area metal oxides for a number of applications. And together with Yeri Roman at MIT in chemical engineering, uh, we recently have developed a generalized synthesis route where uh, you can actually start with uh, nanoparticles of the binary oxides, let's say lanthanum oxides and mang uh, manganese oxides, and then we would essentially load them on carbon nanoparticles and then heat treat them um, at high temperature in air for a short time uh, through which one can generate nanoparticles uh, or nanoparticle fibers or 
um, uh, rods uh, connected. And this type of uh, methods can be generalized for a number of these perovskites, right? So lanthanum manganite, ferrite, uh, nicolate, uh, cobalt, or substituted uh, uh, cobalt type. And so typically we have uh, uh, particle sizes on the order of 20 to, uh, let's say, 50 nanometers. And with this type of uh, um, uh, oxides with much higher surface area, we can see the mass activity of uh, such oxide can be increased 100 times for, let's say, oxygen reduction reactions for manganese-based oxide and uh, for oxygen evolution. Uh, similarly, we see a much enhanced uh, mass-based activity uh, for uh, cobalt-based uh, oxide as well, right? So much to be done there to, to really have the dispersion that we have seen uh, for platinum or noble metal-based uh, catalyst, right? So now, so far, we have been uh, utilizing the concept, which is somehow bulk electronic structure of oxides and it's influencing the catalytic activity, right? So the question is, can we translate the bulk electronic structure, oxygen P-band, to uh, the surface oxygen um, P-band? And how do we draw this connection uh, and try to probe what are actually on the surface that gave us the turnover of water splitting or oxygen evolution? And so to do this, really see what are the potential active sites and what are the real limiting steps uh, for a given reaction, we turn uh, to single crystals, right? So in this case, uh, I will show you uh, some results from single crystal uh, of ruthenium dioxide, right? Because there are readily very high quality crystals of uh, different surfaces available. So we do single crystal electrochemistry. We do in-situ uh, surface investigation using synchrotrons. So for example, you can use synchrotron X-rays to do crystal truncation rod analysis uh, in the electrochemical cell where you can scan the voltage and you would see uh, only the surface or the surface changes, right, as you scan the voltage and through which you can actually deduce uh, how the surface or the surface monolayer, the coverage of from water to, uh, let's say, uh, water cover to OH and O cover surface as you scan up in voltage, right? So really probe the changes, um, the coverage uh, changes uh, as function voltage uh, on a single crystal surface. Once uh, we have the experimental result, we can actually couple with um, density functional theory of the such a surface to, to allow us to uh, assign the reaction mechanism and the real limiting step. So I'm going to show you an example of three surfaces of ruthenium dioxide, 110, 100, and one, uh, one surface. And for all the surfaces, the active site is ruthenium cos site, ruthenium under-coordinated site, as is shown here, right? So it's really uh, um, ruthenium 6 uh, coordination, where this is the apical is the active site, right? So uh, similarly, we have a very similar site for the 100 surfaces. What's the difference for these three surfaces is the coordination of oxygen are different, right? So as we go from 110 and 100, the oxygen has less uh, coordination. And as a result, uh, it changes the ruthenium oxygen P-band center relative to the Fermi level, right? From left to right, we reduces the oxygen, um, essentially we, we reduce the oxygen P-band center relative Fermi level, right? Another way to say it is we raise the Fermi level relative to oxygen P-band, and the net effect is the binding of this oxygen onto the cus site is uh, weakened, right? And uh, as we've seen previously, as you have essentially lower um, uh, changes to oxygen P-band center, you change the binding uh, onto uh, a particular uh, metal site, right? And so this has significant uh, consequences. As you change the oxygen P-band center for a metal site, it changes uh, the reaction limiting step for oxygen evolution, right? So let's look at 110 surface, right? So know that all those structural features and energetics were re deduced through combination of in-situ X-ray um, CTR measurement and DFT, 
right? So all these uh, bound distances and angles that were all measured and also um, calibrated through a DFT, right? So for a 110 surface, uh, we have an O covered surface and uh, what really happening at 1.5 volt is we have a OOH group um, that is essentially uh, relimiting or stuck on the surface uh, that has a barrier to essentially de uh, deprotonate this species to become, uh, to evolve oxygen, right? So essentially it's really, how do you deprotonate uh, this OOH uh, group uh, is really limiting for this particular surface. So if you go to a 1OO surface, essentially we weaken the oxygen binding onto the surface, right? So we lift up the energy levels in such a way that this OO that is uh, onto the cus site uh, is actually uh, it's at the same energy level as oxygen evolution, right? So significantly reduce the barrier to deprotonate uh, this particular site. And one expect this should have much higher activity than the 110 surface. If you further weaken the energy for on the 101 surface, that's sure deprotonation is no longer energetically limiting, uh, but the prior step between O to OOH becomes really limiting. Right. So this essentially uh, correlation of influence oxygen p bands under relative Fermi level, right, influence the binding energy, and it, it changes essentially the relimiting step and changes its activity um, from a DFT uh, computed reaction mechanism. And this is uh, in uh, excellent agreement with experimental data of measurement of these uh, single crystal uh, surfaces were essentially with the same cus site, well, with the same cus site by changing essentially the differences in oxygen p-band center relative to the Fermi level of the cus site, you can actually change the activity by up to five or six times through selenium. Further lend support to the idea of changing oxygen p-band center on for the surface site, you can also tune the catalytic activity and through which tune uh, the reaction rate. So the next example that I'm going to uh, show is uh, related to the surface reactivity of lithium ion batteries, right? So we use uh, cobalt or nickel oxides for catalyzing various reactions for water splitting oxygen uh, reduction. Uh, we also use very similar oxides, cobalt or nickel based oxides in the positive electrode materials of lithium ion batteries. So they have very similar electronic structure, right? Late transition metal and valence state uh, three plus or four plus, right? So the question is when we have such a covalent oxides, right? We know its surface is uh, highly active, right? We can generate oxygen vacancies and uh, metal uh, and uh, oxygen, uh, they uh, share density states uh, on top of at the Fermi level, right? So both metal can bind with azorbates and so our oxygen can also bind azorbates. And this is where uh, we see uh, quite a bit of uh, reactivity of positive electrodes with respect to the uh, electrolyte. So give you an example, right? So if in the case of well-known positive electrode, NMC, right, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxide for lithium ion batteries. If you increase nickel in this material, you can significantly uh, increase um, its sort of a capacity loss or fade. And this has to do with uh, what we see is a dissociative absorption of EC molecules or carbonates on the surfaces. As you increase the uh, surface oxygen p-band relative to Fermi level, you increase the driving force significantly up to two EVs, right? And this has to do with the fact that uh, we have these more reactive surface oxygen sites and that can bind with um, uh, the oxygen uh, that combined with carbonate, right, and essentially strip off uh, hydrogen and, uh, and make the hydrogen into a proton um, on the surfaces, right? So the driving force for the associate absorption is really changing hydrogen to proton and absorb onto the surface uh, oxygen site and through which uh, we 
uh, reduce the surface metal site, right? Because cobalt or nickel, they don't want to stay in the high valence state, they would like to be reduced. And this reaction mechanism is supported by in situ FTIR measurement, and through which you can see as we increase the voltage, we can see a signal of VC uh, emerging. And, uh, and VC, uh, this is verified by computed FTIR uh, data and uh, with exhibiting much higher wave number uh, than the EC. And if we uh, do the same measurement uh, with NMC111, we see no signal of no formation of the VC molecules. And so this mechanism, right, oxidative dehydrogenation, right? So essentially you have EC absorb onto the oxygen site and strip off a hydrogen, right? And to become a proton on the nearby oxygen. This uh, allow us to examine, explore a large library of materials. We can see what's the driving force for hydrogen absorption, right? So we want to choose a material that has minimum driving force for hydrogen to absorb onto the surface and through which reduces the reactivity of a carbonate electrolyte uh, with the oxide surfaces, right? So to test this idea that we have essentially chose uh, fluorine-based compound, we fluorinated NMC811, and with the fluorination, you can see the uh, cycling of the a a a NMC811 is significantly increased. Right. So this, we think it has to do with a stabilized the fluorinated uh, surfaces and that uh, prevent the further reactivity of uh, oxidative dehydrogenation reaction. And this reaction is detrimental to lithium ion batteries because we generate protons and the protons can react with anions and through which essentially further uh, degrade the electrolyte and the electrolyte will lose essentially reactive, uh, conductivity and also the fragment can passivate the surfaces leading to higher impedance. Right? So this is one example how you can actually play with, uh, let's say oxygen P-band and to uh, reduces the um, oxidative dehydrogenation of uh, organics on the oxide surfaces enhances a stability, right? And this same idea can be extended to selective uh, oxidation of uh, hydrocarbons, right? Sometimes we may need to convert propane to propene. We may convert methane to methanol. And, uh, and one of the common mechanisms is oxidative dehydrogenation reaction, which is uh, very similarly that you can actually grab uh, oxygen from on the metal oxide if the oxygen has a low uh, formation energy penalty of oxygen vacancies. And if the oxygen is uh, highly basic, you can actually grab uh, hydrogen from the hydrocarbons and become essentially a, a proton, right? So this is essentially the same mechanism one can play with uh, to have uh, selective oxidative reactions. So I want to uh, sort of uh, give, uh, hopefully it's the last example of uh, a lattice oxygen redox. And right? so far we've been looking at redox of small molecules of uh, you know, water change to oxygen evolution, right? So it's oxygen reduction, oxygen evolution, right? So what we're interested in now is, can we do the same with uh, solids, right? So can we, what, what happens if we oxidize, oxidize uh, oxide, right? So we can oxidize oxides, they can uh, evolve oxygen, right? So where we can oxidize oxides, there might be some uh, oxygen-oxygen coupling inside the, so inside the solid state. And can we relate and translate some of the learnings of oxygen P-band of toning electronic structure of oxide on the surfaces and apply it to the solid state? And this is particularly interesting for lithium ion battery community uh, because since the initial pioneer concept of Mike Thackeray that utilizing lithium rich transition metal oxides uh, where he has proposed that uh, some of the oxygen redox may be you know, responsible for the uh, extra capacity providing enhanced uh, energy density of lithium ion batteries. And, uh, and recently uh, in the past, uh, a few years, uh, researchers have been using, utilizing lithium ruthenate as a model system, really studied the oxygen redox, right? So we're particularly interested in, are there any evidence, right, to, for the oxygen coupling in solid states? 
right? If we have OO coupling in the solid state, we should expect to see bonding and anti-bonding states of OO coupling, right? And uh, how can we control it, right? So we can either have OO coupling in the solid state, we have actually illusion. And then in the lithium ion batteries, we don't want actually illusion, right? We want a reversible lattice oxygen redox so that we can store energy. Right. So this is something that we were very interested in understanding how to control, can we de develop a descriptor to enhance the, um, the uh, lattice oxygen readout so we can store more. And more importantly, uh, can we you know, utilize non-precious transition metal instead of using uh, ruthenium? Right. So if we have uh, OO coupling, we expect, for example, this OO to couple, right? So this is sigma sigma, so we expect to have a bonding bond, at bonding and anti-bonding states. And we find if we look at the oxygen K edge of ruthenium um, uh, oxide, and if we charge it uh, for X-ray emission, uh, this peak uh, uh, become broadened significantly at a high top of charge. And utilizing a simulation uh, of the spectra uh, through a DFT and ocean, that we see that uh, this broadening actually coming from the formation of uh, OO coupling, a formation of sigma star uh, uh, states uh, in this oxide, uh, providing uh, unique support of oxygen coupling in this material. And this is also in agreement with um, if we do uh, croup or crystal orbital overlap population analysis, and uh, essentially this uh, also support uh, the uh, OO coupling in the material. Okay. Now, what we show even, uh, what we find even more interesting is that if we have uh, oxides with a different metal oxygen covalency, uh, there is a different correlation with the lattice dynamics. So, for example, if we look at lithium, uh, lithium ruthenate versus uh, lithium manganite, ruth ruthenate is more covalent than manganite. As we delithiate this material and we look at phonon density states, right? So previously all the density states you have seen are electron density states, but now what you see in this graph is phonon density states. And as you, uh, in the case of ruthenium with high covalency, we see a slight hardening of uh, oxygen p-band, right? So that's the, the p-band of which is the phonon dos, right? So slight shift to the right. On the other hand, for manganite, less covalent, we see that at high delithiation, we have the uh, unique signature of oxygen dimer around uh, um, this uh, frequency, right? So, so it means that this material it will want to form oxygen dimer at the delithiated states. You can really see this. And uh, the rest of the lattice is actually uh, shifted to the left, right? So rest of oxide lattice actually softens. Right. So this gives us a very interesting correlation, essentially for a strongly covalent compound like ruthenium iridium in the lithium-2, um, ruthenium-03 configuration as you delithiate. Essentially, uh, what we are seeing is the lattice is actually hardens, right? So it means that the metal oxygen bond is actually getting stronger, uh, is strong enough to hold down to the oxygen-oxygen coupling. On the other hand, for less covalent compound, there, the covalency is not strong enough to hold down to OO coupling. Essentially what we have is, you know, we have emergence of um, a formation of dimers uh, in the structure, which we believe is structurally uh, unstable that, can, that will lead to spontaneous oxygen evolution. Right. So test this idea that we substituted the number of uh, um, transition metal substituted uh, uh, lithium ruthenate compounds. You substitute iridium, uh, tin, platinum, manganese, uh, chromium, iron, right? And we can actually measure the electronic covalency, uh, which is the measure of the D states relative to the P states. We're familiar with that. And you can see that as we increase the covalency, we increase the reversible oxygen redox, right? So the vertical axis is a measure of uh, the lattice redox versus oxygen evolution, right? So essentially, as you make them more covalent, the reversible oxygen uh, redox in the lattice increases and lattice uh, and the oxygen evolution, right, formation of the gas actually reduces. 
And there is also similar correlation that uh, as you make the bond stronger, right, having stronger covalency, uh, you see that uh, during the lithiation, the, the band, the oxygen phonon band actually get hardens. And so this is, we think is really strong metal oxygen bond as a key to, to give rise to hardening of the oxygen lattice and enable lattice uh, oxygen redox. So this is uh, essentially uh, what we, we think that's to stabilize oxygen redox to potentially utilizing a highly um, high valence state uh, transition metal that might be key to, to potentially stabilize a lattice oxygen redox. I've been uh, speaking for 40 minutes and I was asked to, to stop at 40. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, wrap up and uh, skip the last part. So what I can tell you is that uh, some of our uh, recent uh, thinking and work is really trying to, um, so far I show you most of the examples are really toning the oxygen redox. Uh, and, and using electronic structure, right? And what uh, we are currently thinking is really how to design materials, utilize, utilize dynamics, right? So for example, if you have a crystalline solid, you're looking at dynamics of the lattice, right? So we shown that if you lower the phonon band center of a solids, you can actually enhance its, uh, uh, you can enhance its, its transport. And uh, you can utilize this uh, to do high throughput computation, high throughput experiments to design um, the newest, uh, fastest uh, diffuser for ions of sodium or lithium. And more excitingly, we are been thinking that can we develop a universal dis uh, descriptors or principles for dynamics of the liquids Right, of the relevant moieties responsible for ion conduction. What are the responsible, what are the important moieties in polymer responsible for ion conductors? And how do we relate to the moieties in the solid states, right? So how do we design these moieties, the dynamics of moieties, so that we can design uh, the transport uh, and ion mobility, right? To, to finish that, I, I think is very exciting uh, to, to design materials um, and develop uh, design principles using electrons and phonons uh, and uh, potentially uh, molecular uh, moieties uh, that can enhance the rates and uh, enhance efficiency and cycle life. So finally, I'd like to thank all the uh, researchers I've been uh, privileged to work with and the funding agencies. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for a very impressive, uh, great talk, uh, Professor Chao Horn. I, I also very enjoy uh, this nice, uh, comprehensive uh, correlation between the electronic structure and oxygen activation. So it's time for the Q&A. So we have uh, several questions in our Q&A chatting window. So let me read the first question. It's by Usan, Usang. Thank you for your valuable presentation. It is very interesting that electronic structure design is closely related to oxygen redox kinetics. Does the tuple slope also follow the same trend with the proposed descriptor? Otherwise, uh, how do you think we can predict tuple? Any other descriptor? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Usang, yes. So it is, this is something that uh, we began to uh, to look at. So the easiest correlation is to correlate, let's say, uh, the uh, tuffle slope with a barrier of electron transfer. Right. So if you have a um, barrier for electron transfer, uh, typically for oxygen evolution, oxygen reduction, typically you see a very high tuffle slope, something like two hundred millivolt per decade. And then if you go to a, a reasonably conducting surfaces, the tuffle slope will drop to, for example, um, 60 millivolt. And so then it gets uh, complicated, right? Be because from 60 millivolt, you can also go down to, for example, 40 millivolt, 30 millivolt, sometimes you see 20 millivolt. And this is where uh, we think uh, it, further studies are needed. And we have shown uh, examples 
uh, that uh, uh, some of the decoupling of, so very often we, we think about electron proton coupled reaction steps, right? Once you begin to decouple, right? You have some chemical step and some electron uh, steps and there's many possibilities to generate uh, tuffle slopes that deviate from, for example, 60. And this is something that uh, I think will be very interesting uh, to look into and further develop, right? And then along this line, I think is really actually fascinating, right? So let's say for ruthenium dioxide, typically we would uh, measure down to let's say 1.5 volts or 1.45 volts, right? And then below, we actually, due to the detection uh, resolution, typically the community doesn't measure below, right? So the really interesting question is, you know, what uh, can we evolve oxygen at 1.3 volt? And what's the top of slope there? Right? And that's some of the questions we've been thinking about, right? I think in the line with uh, the question you have. Okay, so there's another question. Uh, it looks like many energy devices are operated under aqueous condition. So I guess one of the biggest issues is the dissolution of the catalyst into electrolyte, especially for precious metal. Is it right? If so, could you give us any design tip to uh, uh, suppress that? <laughs> That's a great question. So, so in fact, uh, ruthenium dioxide, even though it's a stable that we can measure a single crystal, but the, the dissolution of ruthenium dioxide, uh, it's still measurable and is more soluble than iridium dioxide. So therefore, ruthenium dioxide is actually not used practically, right? So just even minute of, of uh, solubility for some of the transition metal uh, is really uh, key and then the, the activity uh, decreases. And this is really, I think it's really interesting, right? So designing catalyst is really a fine balance of many processes, right? So if you activate a certain site and tend to actually develop a reduced barrier, a correlated process with many other processes. So, so this is something I think is really interesting. I, I, I think further studies are needed Right. And uh, personally, I don't understand dissolution and just not a catalyst of any materials. I actually don't understand the dissolution. Right. So I think it would be super fascinating to, to actually to, to look into the mechanism and look for descriptors. Oh, thank you very much. Nice uh, answer. So uh, another question by Jehan An. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, these are very comprehensive set of design principles and are extremely helpful. Could you briefly comment on how could we achieve passive control of oxide to optimize their binding energies? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so, so one example I showed in this talk uh, is that uh, you can actually choose the different, uh, let's say you can either cross guides or you can choose, for example, um, Rutel structure, and you, we, we show the example of 110 and 100 and 101 surface, right? So you can actually um, look at uh, uh, different coordination uh, of the oxygen site uh, that give rise to different oxygen p-band center for the ruthenium cus site, and then that's correlated with essentially different binding uh, of uh, binding strengths of oxygen or oxygen-related species onto um, the ruthenium cus site. And uh, because of different binding strengths, it changes essentially the relimiting step or changes the relative energies of different steps so through which changes the um, relimiting step for the overall reaction. Okay, so, so the time, I'd like to make it the, the uh, last question. It's by the Dong Ha Kim. Excellent talk, Professor Yang. The oxide gel synthesis is very impressive since most oxide particles are easily aggregated during process. Can we expand this oxide gel preparation for multi heterojunction creation, for example, by using two different oxides at the same process? So iridium catalyst and bismuth strontium cobaltite catalyst, mm -hmm. then we can see iridium decorated bismuth strontium cobaltite gel. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. 
And the, the reason we have to use that process is because perovskite, in order to crystallize in the right structure, we have to heat treat it at the right high temperature, right? So, and that in the highly oxidizing conditions. And then we also need, to, for example, mixing of these sort of very dissimilar elements. But I think, you know, if what is suggested, it can be done maybe at the low temperature and the relatively reducing conditions once you have this gel. So, so I think there's a lot of possibilities, a great idea. Okay, so thank you very much. So because of a time limit, I have to finish the first presentation here. So thank you very much for the very impressive talk, Professor Xiaohol. Thank you so much.